Welcome to From the VC's Bookshelf, a podcast from TBR, the College System of Tennessee, the state's largest higher education system. In this series, we examine how we might re-envision the work we do and how we work together as we move into a post-pandemic world. Please join our host, Dr. Heidi Lemming, Vice Chancellor for Student Success, as she leads a live discussion with industry experts and leaders throughout our system. Hello, welcome to the Tennessee Board of Regents inaugural podcast series, discussing themes from the book, Disruptive Transformation, Leading Creative and Innovative Teams in Higher Education. This book is sponsored by the National Association of Student Affairs Administrators, otherwise known as NASPA, and was published in 2020. So this show is the first in a three-part podcast series focused on learning from higher education and industry leaders on how to build and cultivate creative teams in higher education as we move past disruptive forces. As introduced by the authors of the book, disruptive transformation is the process of becoming a creative and innovative leader. It involves an individual not only changing others and organizations, but also themselves. It requires leaders to let go and say, yes and, to the opportunities that lie ahead. So in today's episode, we will discuss aspects of this definition of disruptive transformation from a senior leadership perspective with Dr. Anthony Wise, president of Pellissippi State Community College, and Dr. Brian Nolan, president of East Tennessee State University. Both panelists will share their personal experiences in leading change at post-secondary institutions and how to foster innovative teams. So let's do some introductions here. Our first guest today is Dr. Anthony Wise. Dr. Wise has served as president of Pellissippi State Community College since July 1st of 2011. In the 13 years prior to assuming the position as president, Dr. Wise held a variety of academic roles at Pellissippi, including vice president of academic and student affairs, vice president of learning, dean of the liberal arts department, and faculty member. Now in his 24th year at Pellissippi, it's been a while, Dr. Wise has served on several national boards, like the National Alliance of Community and Technical Colleges, the Southern Regional Education Board, and the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Locally, he has also served on the boards of Knox Ed Foundation, Knox County Industrial Development Board, and the Knoxville Chamber, among others. Dr. Wise earned a PhD in history from the University of Tennessee. Thanks for being here, Dr. Wise. Thanks for having me, Dr. Wise. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. We're also joined by Dr. Brian Noland. Dr. Noland has served as the ninth president of East Tennessee State University since January 2012. Prior to assuming the presidency, Dr. Nolan served for six years as the chancellor of the West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission and has held a variety of positions at the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. President Nolan has guided the long-term visioning processes for many initiatives at the university, as well as the creation of a decentralized budget structure that aligns strategic planning and budgeting. He is a board member for the American Council on Education, the American Association of State Colleges and Universities, Ballot Health, and the Tennessee Valley Authority. Dr. Nolan earned her PhD in political science from the University of Tennessee. Thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. So we're going to have some interesting conversation. I'm excited to launch this podcast series. I think this is going to be really great to just have some honest conversation about the challenges facing higher education uh, specifically, but also this concept of disruptive transformation and uh, today, we want to focus on even your personal perspectives and experiences and in, in leading organizations through that, and maybe even how your background shape how you uh, lead organizations through that. So let's dive in. Um, the authors describe disruptive transformation as a way of harnessing creative and innovative leadership to make proactive change. So, you know, rather than slow, delayed, or reactive changes, um, really how you carry your institutions into the future. So the goal is to have institutions that meet the needs of their communities and provide high quality education to those in your community by adopting all the resources and technologies that are available uh, to support student learning uh, and by thinking creatively about the improvements 
that you can make, right? So my first uh, question, really, uh, Dr. Wise, I'd like to throw this to you. In your 23 years at Pellissippi State, I know, big number, um, what often prompted you as a leader to think about the need to innovate or make improvements at the institution? Yeah, so I, I, I kind of grouped this into kind of three different categories. I think sometimes you need to innovate in order to solve a problem. Uh, I think sometimes you need to innovate to take advantage of an opportunity that presents itself. And then, of course, I think we've all been faced with the fact that we've needed to innovate over the course of the last couple of years in response to a real crisis, um, you know, something that we have to dig through in the long term. But if we take the, the first opportunity and how to solve a problem. So I've been at Pell City State 23, 24 years. Um, when I started here, um, I got a big notebook of – uh, all the advising pathways for our students. And in August, we would gather and have this sort of cattle call registration where we would try and, you know, bring six, eight, nine hundred 900 students through the process and get them enrolled in Pellissippi State three or four days before classes started in, in late August. Um, that creates some real issues for us as an institution in terms of student success. So if you think about something like Knox Achieve starting as a local last dollar scholarship program, I think one of the most important things that Knox Achieves did, and as it became Tennessee Achieves and Tennessee Promise, is it asked students who are thinking about community and technical college to think about enrolling in those institutions a year ahead of time. So not the middle of August, a week before classes started, but kind of forcing that change that, that allowed those students to think, hey, I might go to a four-year institution, but I might be going to a, a community college and I might be going to the TCAT in my, in my hometown. And I've got to start thinking about that in November if I'm going to take advantage of this great opportunity that's, that's available. So I think that's an example of a change. And what it did was it allowed us to align many of the things that we wanted to do. I think it, by that point, you know, when it started, no, we all realized that it's not a great idea for somebody to be driving by the campus and say, oh, I should stop by and register for co college this week and start classes next week. And so, you know, that was an example of a problem that existed for institutions that, that's, um, that allowed us to begin f finding better ways to serve students through, through a, a partnership that's gone, gone statewide. Now, the pandemic has kind of reintroduced some of the challenges around that problem because a lot of the communications about enrolling have been disrupted over the last uh, couple of years. So now we're, you know, are there other ways we can take advantage of technology and other forms of communication and different kinds of partnership to get back to hey, if you're going to go to TCAT Knoxville next fall or if you're going to go to Pellissippi State, you need to be thinking about that just as much if you're going to enroll in ETSU. Right. Yeah, and we'll, we'll dig in, I think, a little bit more here about, you know, what the pandemic uh, really forced us to think about. But before we do that, Dr. Nolan, you know, a lot of the, the national conversation, if you don't mind kind of a, addressing this, the national conversation and public confidence in the role of higher education to really make a difference, I guess, in, in society is being called into question. Um, there was a, a recent uh, article published by the Chronicle of Higher Ed in July of this year that um, was reporting on data that um, the New America had published, but um, showed that uh, public confidence, the ability of higher education to lead our nation in a positive direction has dropped from about 14 percentage points since just 2020. Um, and, and it talked about, you know, only half of the respondents agree that colleges are having a positive effect on the country. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, you've worked not only at an institution, but when we think about, you know, state governing uh, agencies, organizations, kind of your perspective of, of how you've maybe seen that change over time and, and what you think is kind of contributing to that decrease in public confidence in higher education. Well, we could really turn this into a whole semester-long discussion right. on public policy challenges facing the country, but I'll do my best to try to touch on the question in a series of, of succinct columns. So I think column one is a column of mission. You know, many institutions, as they evolve, go through a mission change. And as you look at the mission of public institutions in the state of Tennessee, they were created for a simple purpose, to improve the quality of life for the people of the state. You know, right down the road is the state's land-grant institution. We're an institution that was founded in 1911 as the land-grant for Central Appalachia. So I think if we could find a way to return to a mission of service, putting people first rather than institutional needs first, I think that would be a good place to start. But clearly, we've got a big hill to climb. I mean, we live in a state where you have lottery scholarship, you have 
Promise Scholarship. You have a significant volume of investments that have been made in students, but our college-going rates are worse than they were when I started at THEC in the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. So what are the things that are driving that change? I think part of the change is just a function of individuals seeing higher education and education as a whole as a pawn on a chessboard to move a political needle. You know, the country has lost faith in higher education in some respects, but in some respects, I don't think it has. Um, there's a big swing between D's and R's. I don't want to get into a political discussion here, but Democrats are much more supportive of higher education from a faith perspective than Republicans. I think a lot of that is because we've lost the discussion around cost. Um, I've got a son who's a senior in high school, and I can tell you how much it costs to go to George Washington University. I also know that if he went to East Tennessee State University, it would essentially be free when you take institutional aid plus the lottery scholarship. We live in a state where if you have a 3.0 high school GPA or a 21, you're out of pocket knowing nothing else about you is going to be a little bit more than $4,500. A student can go to Pellissippi State at no cost. So the cost conversation is a conversation that we've allowed to get away from us, which has then led us to a debt conversation. Half of our students graduate with debt. The other half have no debt at all. Those who have debt is $19,000. Not to dis diminish $19,000, but it's fairly decent used Honda Civic. <laughs> um, but we've allowed the narrative to move on us. Part of it's cost, but I think a lot of it is also mission. We exist to serve the people of this state. And the more we can get back to the blocking and tackling of service, um, I think this will swing. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious if, as a leader of an institution, how you're thinking about that in practical ways. Well, in practical terms, we are up for our 10-year reaffirmation affirmation for Sachs. It's a sign you've been somewhere a long time when you were here when we went through 10 years ago. And Bert Box said, Brian, I'm not going to be here the next time around. I did everything <laughs> I could to convince him to stay, but he's not here this time around. But our QEP is focused on public service. Um, we will take that QEP and spin that into a full center. Um, we do a great deal of service work, but we don't account for it. There's a great deal of work that faculty do in the community, staff do in the community, and students do in the community, but we've not told the story well. So that will be the centerpiece of our QEP and the reaffirmation with SACS. Can I, can yeah. I pick up on that notion of mission? Um, so we've just gone through that process. I've gone through it my second time. I don't know if I'll go through it a third time. Or not. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to go through it a third time. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> um, but, I, but, when, but I think when you think about the crisis last year, I mean, so what, what do you hold on to? And I think for an institution, you have to hold on to your mission and values, right? When you've got this chaos that's spinning around you, whether it's coming from from the politics, from the social change, from the fact that we're trying to deal with the pandemic, I think you have to hold on uh, to the mission and values. You know, what, what are you supposed to offer the citizens of this state? And if we think about a community college even more locally, what are we at Pellissippi State supposed to offer the citizens of, of Knox and Blount County? And our mission talks about the importance of providing a transformative environment for the individual and the community. Um, so, so how do we have a transformative experience for those students who walk through this door? Um, when I speak to students at commencement, every single one of them can name the three or four people who were part of that transformative experience for them. But we all know the reality is and not enough students reach that, that point. Um, so I think we have to really start thinking differently about how we put together that transformative experience, maybe in ways that are different than the blocks and tools that we've used, right? Semesters, 15 now, you know, 15 week long semesters, are, are those, is that the right way to approach uh, educating our students? Is there more we can do with workforce training in terms of providing greater connection and true integration with our business partners instead of sort of one-off relationships where you get eight students who have a wonderful uh, apprenticeship experience at ORNL, but we don't have every student who is in our engineering technology program having that, that benefit. So I think we're gonna hone in on our mission, but we've gotta figure out ways of delivering what we have to offer as an educational experience um, in much broader ways uh, that, that leads to increase uh, in student success. So I want to ask a, a, a question that leans into your specific role as a president about that, because that's a, a really good point. You're responding to the community needs, really trying to uh, tell the story about the, the place that you are with serving those needs. But I also know that you probably have enormous pressure from a lot of diff different external constituents who might pull you in different directions sometimes. And I just, as a president, can you speak to like what, what that's like, I guess, how you um, reconcile that with 
a mission that you have said you're going to be committed to as an institution, and when you're asked to do something that maybe doesn't align with that, but there's pressure there, how does that work out as a president for you? We are focused on mission every day. Um, if we were back on campus, staff's going to be in the audience wondering how long is it going to take him to say it. So we are 16 minutes in. <laughs> East Tennessee State University was founded in 1911 for a singular purpose, to improve the quality of life for the people of the region. I say that in every speech, every address, every meeting. It's a reminder of why we exist. So if you look at you know pressure, tug and pull on a university, I find a way to take everything back to that mission. The bulk of the teachers in our region were trained at ETSU. 75% of all the healthcare practitioners in our region graduated from ETSU. 80% of the people who live within a 30 mile circumference of campus who have a baccalaureate degree graduated from our university. So if there was no East Tennessee State University in our portion of the state, it would look very, very, very different. So we try to tie economic development, health care, you name it, back to that mission. Our board meeting was last Friday, and I walked the board through what I felt was the most significant mission challenge facing our region and the state at the current moment, and that's gaps in the pipeline. So we all know the college going rates dropped more than 10%. College going rate in Washington County is 52%. Now, that's of students mm -hmm. who graduated from high school. So step that back for a minute. If you take 100 ninth graders, how many of those ninth graders are going to graduate from high school on time where I live? About 80. Of those, half go to college, so now I'm at 40. Of those, at best, 15 graduate. So 100 ninth graders, 15 college graduates. That's the challenge. That's the mission. So it's weaving everything through there and then doing your best to avoid the noise. You know, there's a lot of noise being focused on higher education now. Um, you know, a number of years ago, the noise was sex week. Now the noise is CRT. Um, I don't know what the noise will be next, but it'll be something. So we have to ensure as leaders that we do not allow ourselves to get caught up in the noise because that's contagious across campus. So mission, mission, mission. We talk about it every day. We align our budget model to it. We align our strategic plan to it. We've aligned our QEP to it. I even write into coaches' contracts for football, basketball, and every other sport. They've got to do volunteer work in the community. It all goes back to mission. That's great. Yeah, and, I, and I think for a community, you know, there, there's some similarities into the mission community colleges if you think about our graduates. So for Pellissippi State, probably between 70 and 80 percent of our graduates stay local. Um, so when we talk about the folks who are going to pass through this institution, um, they're going to be contributing members of this community. They're going to be nurses. They're going to be welders. They're going to be working in our manufacturers. They're going to transfer to, uh, to four-year institutions and come back and uh, uh, raise their, their families here. Um, so again, I think it's how we tighten up that pipeline and, and you know we certainly have challenges and frankly we have challenges we can work together coming out of this this particular pandemic crisis as we get on the other other side of it because um, I do think there is great opportunity in the state of Tennessee to pursue higher education but but the numbers are daunting you know if you look at 2015 the year Tennessee promise went statewide I think the college going rate in the state hit what 66 percent or so and you know we're headed to the the low to mid 50s um, and that's uh, you know that's that's a daunting challenge. So how do we get back in and talking about, you know, what are the pi uh, pipelines? How do we truly integrate the educational experience? And that's the conversation we're having on our campus. But how do we integrate it with our partners, whether they're four-year institutions or our local employers? Um, uh, because they're all screaming out for, for workforce and, and, and individuals who can help uh, generate business and revenue uh, in the local community. I think there's, there's an opportunity here to really look at the interaction between universities and community colleges. You know, one of the unintended consequences of the FOCUS Act is we don't spend time together anymore. You know, we in the past would have been here for the board meeting. There would have been hallway conversations around enrollment. There would have been hallway conversations around things we can do to assist students as they look to realize their dreams. Those conversations aren't happening anymore. So how can we begin to have them at a local level, um, I think, is something that's really, really important. It's one of the reasons why I'm honored to be here today. Yeah. Yeah, so I want to, yeah, that's a great segue. I want to talk about, you know, how we communicate um, as, as part of this um, conversation around disruption, how we manage that. Um, so we've cited the pipeline issues uh, being something that we're currently experiencing. We know a recent example even being how quickly we had to leap forward in, in online education uh, during the pandemic, um, you know, in, in ways that we maybe didn't consider uh, 
fully, I guess, at that point. So, you know, making that that rapid leap. Um, there's a book, Eat, Sleep, Innovate, um, that talks about the author, Scott Anthony, talks about in the midst of a crisis um, that it's a really important for leaders to communicate in a realistically optimistic way um, and that realistic optimism um, is acknowledging that, yeah, it's hard. It's hard now. It's going to be hard tomorrow, but eventually it's not going to be that hard, right? We just kind of have to keep working through that. So um, that mindset kind of, you know, shows empathy for the struggle that everyone's going through, but also inspires hope about tomorrow's opportunities. And so I really want to have you all think, uh, speak to the fact that, you know, your own personal experiences and, and leading an institution through some kind of transformational experience, a crisis, you know, what were the, the key communication strategies you used with stakeholders um, as you were moving through that crisis? And I might just throw that out there for whoever wants to take that question first, because I know both of you have had some interesting challenges. I think one of the elements that's the hardest part of being in these positions is the recognition that these positions also impact family. So I live in a small town. Um, everyone knows who I am, but everyone also knows who my wife and son are. And you've got to balance the work life and the family life, but sometimes they run together. So a couple of years ago, there was a thing that was moving through our community and rather difficult. And I wanted to ensure that I communicated with the same tone, both on campus and at home, um, but that's hard. There was a day there was a protest outside of my office and my son came to bring me dinner. And my wife was out of town and he couldn't get in the building and sent me a text message you know, saying, Dad, you probably shouldn't come outside for a little bit. This was a period when I was driving a different car to work every day, and I was wearing a vest. Mm -hmm. um, so when I got home, it's about 1030, and there's my son in the living room with all the lights on, and he's got a, a weapon. The only weapon we own is a Red Ryder BB gun. I had it when I was a little kid. <laughs> but he's got that Red Ryder BB gun, and he's sitting there in the dark. And I said, Jackson, what are you doing? And he said, well, Dad, if they were going to come here and try to kill us, I wanted them to know I was at least armed. Mm. That's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep an optimistic outlook when everything around you is swirling? Walk your campus. The beauty of post-secondary education are the students we serve. On your worst days, set everything down and go out and talk to a student. I hold open office hours every Tuesday morning from 8 to 9 o'clock. And last Tuesday, a young woman came in, and we sat and talked for a little bit. And I said, who's your favorite faculty member? She told me this individual's name. And what was so rewarding about it is 10 years ago, that student was an undergraduate student at our university. He delayed graduating a semester because he knew we were going to start football and he knew we were going to start a band, and he was our first, first drum major. He then got a master's degree from UT, and now he's a faculty member at the university. That person was who she referenced as her favorite faculty member. So the ability to tie all these pieces together and then to use those stories when you talk to your campus is change hard? Yes. Are the things happening around us at the current moment hard? Yes. But they've always been hard. Nothing about this is easy because we educate first-generation, low-income students, and we serve them on their best days and their worst days. That's what gets you through. So for commun a communication perspective, it's being open, honest, transparent, but reminding everyone, no matter how hard it is, we've got a responsibility to serve our students. That's great. Thanks for sharing that story. That's impactful. Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with um, that notion of walking the campus and looking for um, connections with students. And I mean, if I'm honest, that was one of the hardest things about the pandemic for me is that like we had so few students on campus, I would actually have a schedule and say, all right, I know the culinary students are in the kitchen right now at 1030. I can walk down there and see it, them. It was me and the squirrels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I know the engineering students are coming in for lab today. I can walk over there and see them. One of the things that's been such a blessing about this fall, it feels like the campus has come back to life. Um, our enrollment's not where we want it to be, but there is life in our campuses across the Pellissippi State foot plant. Um, and so I feel m more optimistic than I have in, in quite a while. Um, I still tried to project a sense of optimism over the course of the last uh, last two years. And so we at Pellissippi State, we have what I call a pandemic and a ransomware attack chaser. Um, you know, so just when we got to the point where we're like, we're looking forward to Christmas last fall, you know, we're looking down, oh, we're going to get two or three weeks off. We can kind of get our heads together and, 
get ready for spring and do it all over again and be a little better, you know, I get a call at six o'clock on Monday morning and, and, you know, our CIO says, Hey, something serious is going on. You need to get to, you need to get to campus as, as quickly as uh, possible. And so, you know, the difference between that and the pandemic is right. We could see the pandemic coming right early January. We're getting health, public health reports. We're kind of starting, you know, this, you know, there's nothing really to worry. You know, February, we're getting a little, you know, March 1st, we're, we're going to have to do something. And March 13th, we're shutting everything down and sending everybody home and flipping the college and the campus over in two weeks. Well, there's no preparation for the kind of thing we went through on December 6th of, of last year, right? You get a call and it's like we're, we're locked, locked down. Um, but some of the things that we learned through, that, through the pandemic really helped us work through the, you know, work the problem, right? It was the first day of exams for us. So the first question, you know, are we canceling exams? Mm-hmm. No, we had a back door into our, our uh, course management system. There was no reason for us to cancel exams. We we're going to continue to push on through. The, are we canceling graduation? No. Graduation is the most important thing we're going to do this semester. We're having it Friday night. Um, and then just work the problems one by one by one. Make sure we knew what our strategy was. Uh, make sure we communicate. One of the things I started doing in the pandemic that I've continued doing, um, and I, I guess I'll see what kind of response I get from my colleagues who are in the, you know, I started recording a minute and a half, two minute, three minute video that goes out every Monday morning. It just says, hey, this is what's going on, right? Sometimes it's good news. Sometimes it's bad news. I always win, you know, try to finish by a reaffirmation that, hey, we're going to get through this. We're Pellis to be strong. We can deal with what's on, what's on, what's on our plate. Um, and try to project that sense of optimism. Um, um, I do believe things are going to get better. I mean, it's, it's in our mission. That's, we're committed to doing this. Um, if we're here, we're in essence joining a community that says we're going to try and th- make things better for our students and for our uh, community as a whole. Is it challenging? Absolutely. Um, has it been uh, incredibly difficult for um, employees throughout the organizational chart? Absolutely. Um, but what brings me great joy is when you walk, you know, even through the pandemic, when you have a student walk across the stage and say, hey, you know what, my chemistry professor really did a great job and, and really helped me see this through, and I'm going to be able to transfer to, uh, to my four-year institution and start my pre-med pathway. Right. Yeah, I mean, technology, of course, is kind of a constant disruptor, right, because it's just evolving all the time, but certainly a cyber attack is not the most pleasant thing to go through as a president, probably. I mean, any other kind of lessons for other executive leaders on that? Yeah, so, so I mean, I think, you know, work the problem, right? I mean, again, just like the pandemic, fit down and figure out what the problems are that you have to solve. The first question, you know, are we going to have exams today? Yes, we're going to figure out how to do this. Uh, the thing we had to figure out, how are we going to communicate with each other, right? Uh, we knew our email was eventually going to go away as a result, you know, so how do you build those networks? How do you create a system where you can start calling people and create a chain and, you know, how do you tell everybody that you have to change their password, that they have to change their password without sending out an email that says, hey, you've got to change your password, mm-hmm. you know, creating some communication structures uh, on the fly. Um, you know, work your cyber response plan. And that's what we did. We sat down and, and work it. Uh, I think one of the most important things, uh, and I tell our students this every chance I get, and I think this is true for institutions. I think it's true for leaders. Ask for help. Um, so we received such great help from the Board of Regents, from our peer institutions, folks who said, hey, you need this script. We can, we can pack it up and send it over to you. So don't be afraid to, uh, to ask for help. Um, I think one of the things going into that if you think about this ahead of time um, is helping departments evaluate priorities um, because, right, every, pri- every department thinks they're priority number one. And every department thinks all of their priorities are priority <laughs> number one. But, but eventually you have to make some decisions mm-hmm. and you have to make some because you only have so much uh, human resource capital to expend um, during this time period. Uh, and I will say just, in, you know, if you're looking for examples of the commitment of folks who work at public institutions, I don't think you can find any greater example than the folks who work the problems between December 6th and when we started class on, what, January 18th? Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, we had people who did not take a day off. Right. Did not take a day off because, um, you know, as we kind of worked through and we, we had some, you know, we had some conversations on December. You know, are we going to be able to have class on January 18th? Is it realistic for us to say, yes, classes are going to start on time? And, you know, I see some of my colleagues in the room. We had that conversation. You know, they posed that question. And I was like, we're going to have class. We're going to figure out how to work the problems in a series that allows us to start class. We cannot be an institution that, that's faced with this challenge and then falls short for our, for our students. And so we had people who worked every single day from the day the attack hit until, well, really well after classes started. But I think what it shows is 
the commitment of people who are generally not in the classrooms or not on the front line of serving students, their commitment to service. And I think that's one of the things I find truly inspirational because, you know, they made a great contribution to student success, even though they're not directly engaged in it. They build the infrastructure and they rebuilt our infrastructure in about five weeks. Wow. Yeah. It's great. Um, it wasn't that great. Well, <laughs> I know. Sorry. I could have missed that. Oh my. The story you we, just told is we, great. We <laughs> joke that we want our emails to go away, but never like yeah. that. <laughs> right. I think I'm just going to have them turned off. <laughs> and we become so dependent on technology that when you get hit with your technology, then it's like, what are we going to do? You're, you're kind of lost. Yeah. Um, so obviously it's easy for us to point to the pandemic as an example of disruption um, and how we've had to adapt. Um, but I, I want us to maybe shift the conversation a little bit now to that forward thinking into the future and how we become advanced and relevant and valuable um, to our students. And so part of that for me, as I think about, you know, I've got two presidents in front of me, I think, I think folks would be really interested in hearing how your personal experiences really shape how you lead teams, uh, how you think about innovation. Um, and, and Dr. Nolan, I mean, again, prior serving as president of ETSU, you, you served as a chancellor for the West Virginia Higher Ed um, Policy Commission and, and held roles, you know, again, at the state level here in Tennessee. So from, from those vantage points, thinking about um, kind of state level and working with a variety of institutions, right, and they all kind of maybe have um, individual uh, challenges, but then you also have to look at the statewide challenges at the same time when you're in those roles. Um, how did how do those prior experiences at that vantage point from the state level? How is that now shaping your leadership as an institutional president? And I mean, what do you what do you take from that past um, that helps you now in your current role? Well, I was very fortunate as a young staff member at THEC to have the opportunity to listen and learn from legends in our state's higher education uh, trajectory, history, pipeline, people like Roy Nix, people like John Folger, people like Grady Bogue, Burke Bach when he was at the board, Rich Rota when he was executive director of THEC, Joe Johnson, president of the University of Tennessee system at that time, and just the ability to sit in a room and absorb their knowledge, their thoughts, the way they approach challenges, the way that Dr. Johnson is the only person who could sit through a legislative hearing and do the crossword puzzle and never get called out on it. Anyone else would, but he was that well-respected. And to ask them questions, how do they navigate difficult issues? How did they make their way through and navigate a challenge? Or how do you face a legislative hearing that you know is not going to go well? That opportunity to, to to witness those wonderful individuals lead is something that I've done my best to try to emulate. The compassion that Dr. Bogue showed for his students, the way even as he was fighting cancer in his early 80s when he was at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, he still got out and walked across the campus. Um, the way that Dr. Roto very quietly uh, navigated challenges but relied upon data. So I took the lessons from those individuals, but from a system perspective, and I've grown up in systems, systems force you to look at a common issue rather than individual issues. There's an opportunity within a system such as the Board of Regents to take a best practice at Dyersburg and replicate that best practice at Northeast State. And what I've tried to do is to look at our institution in a similar way. I mean, we're 14,500 students, 2,600 faculty and staff. From the time you entered this world at the hands of an ETSU physician, go to our university school, graduate, and then when you exit the world, if you exit in a complicated manner, who does the autopsy? We, because we're the chief medical officer, so cradle to grave. Colleges are no different than institutions. So the university itself, I try to look at it from a system perspective, and then to look at how you navigate that system of colleges the same way you would navigate a system of institutions to move towards a common objective. That takes me back once again to mission. Um, but as a leader, be it at a system level or at a campus level, it's to be authentic, to be transparent, to be compassionate, and to be genuine. Um, those are all personality traits that I've tried to, to borrow from people like Grady Bogue, Joe Johnson, Rich Rota, Bert Bach, and others. I've, I've had the greatest fortune 
to grow up in a state with outstanding leaders. Yeah, that's great. And the history there. I mean, that's amazing, too. Um, Dr. Wise, you knew this was going to come up. We, we talked about this in advance. <laughs> but, I mean, you have a unique uh, perspective as well, uh, not only coming from a history background, right? So you've got this always studying how history maybe reinvents itself in some way, right? Um, but here at Pellissippi, you all have made significant investments in international education, hosting a consortium uh, on behalf of all of the, the community colleges in the state and, and valuing the role of international perspectives. So, you know, just because I'm here, I've got the opportunity to ask you, right, like, how does your experience serving as a president uh, and going abroad with faculty uh, and, and your background, how does that shape um, your approach to innovation and creativity? I mean, does that, or does it shape it? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I'm going to kind of see if I can take it in two parts. So my background is a historian. Um, so a lot of times I'll talk about the institution or at least try to set the, the framework for our discussions in, in some kind of context. Um, so when we think about Pellissippi State, um, we got our start in 1974, a state technical institute in Knoxville. We had 45 students, most of whom were veterans of the Vietnam War, uh, 16 employees, and all of our degrees were in electrical, chemical, mechanical engineering. So a really narrow, tightly focused organization. But even though the words have changed in our mission over the years, I still think the commitment was there for having that transformative impact uh, on those individuals and providing that transformative impact upon uh, the community. Now, we've gone through some historical eras over the time, right? We added our business programs. We had a, uh, a, a little campus out at uh, uh, Lakeshore uh, Park. Um, we became a comprehensive community college in the mid-1980s uh, and began to experience some significant enrollment growth for the first time. We almost began to see the institution flip in the early 1990s um, because uh, while we still carried about the same number uh, of uh, technical programs in business and engineering and then later media, those were growing at a relatively small uh, rate. What was growing rapidly was the amount of transfer to the University of Tennessee. And if you asked a student in when I the first semester I advised, and they walked 100 students walked through the door, 99 of those were transferring. So well, I'm going to take a few classes here and transfer to the University of Tennessee. And you know we became that institution for a while. Um, and then uh, you know in the uh, 2009 or 10 with the Complete College Act and the introduction of the Knox Promise, which became uh, Knox Achieves, which became Tennessee Achieves and Tennessee Promise, sort of a new era, right? Rapid growth responding to the um, um, the recession of the, the 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, multiple transfer partners, uh, students being willing to pursue transfer at a number of different different places. Um, and so those are the kind of historical errors. I think I think we're on the precipice of, a, of another sort of historic change, right? Mm -hmm. Pell City State is going to be different. It's going to have to be different if we're going to serve our students and serve our community um, going forward. I think one of the benefits of traveling internationally and participating in programs through an organization like Tenses is that opportunity for ongoing learning and growth or initiating a series of, uh, of, uh, of learnings uh, for our students and faculty and for, for our staff. Um, one of my biggest regrets as an undergrad um, was that I did not participate in a study abroad experience. And I talked to students about this. I was, um, you know, my, I, was, I didn't come from a wealthy family, and honestly, I couldn't figure out how my parents would... Uh, help support me if I went on a study abroad experience. So I didn't even bring it up. I was like, this this is outside the realm of possibility for me as a uh, as a student. Um, but I want it to be within the realm of possibility for students who are at, at the community colleges across the, the state of Tennessee and part of the TBR system and part of uh, Pellissippi State Community College because I, I think it forces you for a short time to think about your place in the world and your place in your community through a different lens. Um, you know, if you spend time... Uh, um, especially, you know, if you go to Eastern Europe, if you have an opportunity to travel to China, uh, if you go to uh, the Galapagos and, and, and do biology research, for, for it forces you to think about yourself and your place in the world in a different uh, in a different way. Um, and I think that's opportunity is there for us uh, as institutions as well. So when I look at higher education models in Great Britain and Germany, I've had a chance to to, to study those uh, a, a little. Um, you know, they, they approach things differently. I think one of the things that's frustrating is, you know, a lot of our partnerships are for small groups of students as opposed to, to, to large uh, numbers of students. You know, so can we think, think about the ways that apprenticeship works in a, uh, in a German uh, village that has a factory where everybody kind of makes a decision when they're 16 or 18, right? This is, this is where I think I want to go. 
I'm going to do a technical diploma. I'm going to go to work for, for Volkswagen for uh, a couple years. And sometimes those students decide after they've, they've done that process, hey, I'm going to the university to get additional education because I'm going to go into management. Um, those pathways are still there. So I think as we look at the next iteration of Pellissippi State, we have to look at what partnerships exist locally. We have to look at what the possibilities are really from a global perspective and then figure out how we best serve uh, our community, how we bring that home, because that's well our said. mission. Well said. And a lot of people forget the amount of foreign investment in yeah. the state of Tennessee, right? I mean, we have a lot of uh, major companies uh, choosing to, to be here in Tennessee, and how are we preparing students even to work in those companies here in Tennessee? With, I mean, because we know that some of those have very uh, institutionalized um, business cultures that are associated with their home country, right, and how we bring that in. I think you, you know, I, I've i been very impressed with the Tensus program, and I, Dr. Wise, have to say thank you uh, on behalf of the other schools because the idea that community college students can go abroad is not something that people think about very often, right? Yeah, and I think, you know, and again, when we think about Tensus and, and the opportunity to participate in a program like that for three weeks or five weeks, and most of our programs are relatively short term for our students who transfer, I think we hope it gives them a taste so, so that when they say, hey, when I get to East TSU, I'm going to take a semester and I'm going to go somewhere and, and take advantage of that. Um, I think it's important. But again, as we think about our conversations now, you know, what I'm thinking about is, all right, participating in a program like that or becoming more global, I mean, that's a high impact practice. So how do we do it at scale? Right. I mean, so how do we say if you're in engineering technology at Pellissippi State, you're going to spend three weeks at uh, Volkswagen in Germany. Right. I mean, how do you make something like that happen? Um, because, again, um, we want our students to have that sort of breadth of experience that, that really gives them a chance to, to say, you know, something transformative happened to me at this institution and it's going to help make me better and it's going to help make our community better. Yeah. I mean, in my role, of course, I'm all about trying to transform student lives and Study abroad clearly does that, um, but we know also in the state of Tennessee, we've got some students that have not left their local communities, have never flown on a plane before. I mean, there's just um, those considerations too, right? Like what are the things that we can uh, show students or possibilities, right? Low-income students probably never think of that, that I could ever go here. Yeah. Uh, uh, on the second trip I took with students abroad, we had a student who tried to check in at the luggage carousel. Right. I mean, it's right. I mean, just don't understand how the mechanisms work. So that's what makes it important to show them the world. And that's a learning experience. Yeah. yeah. Right. Great. Well, so, you know, we're getting close to the end of our time today. Um, in the final minutes, I want to kind of think about how we identify um, barriers to successful execution of change. So higher education isn't always known for being quick <laughs> with change, nimble. Um, but you know, the intentional steps that we can take to be successful in our efforts. Um, there was an article in 2016 that Harvard Business Review did, and they surveyed uh, 80 senior executives from 20 countries, 25 industries, and, and really, like, what they were thinking about in terms of change. And overwhelmingly, the response was focused around structures and reinventing processes um, and when they were asked, you know, what was the biggest barrier to that long-term execution, 76% cited employee interaction. So in other words, people failing to work together to make change happen. Uh, and so, you know, the result is most initiatives fail to deliver on the intended uh, benefits because of the desire that people have to kind of control that process of change. So, you know, thinking about that research and that one of the major barriers to change and sustaining that effort uh, is the fact that people just don't maybe work as well together. I'd love to get thoughts on, you know, how you've really tackled that, that um, concept of, you know, we've talked about a common vision as an executive leader, but how you really tackle key strategies to getting folks to come together and, and really work towards that vision. And, and Dr. Nolan, I'd like to have you answer that. Each semester when I teach a graduate leadership course I'd, on higher education, I begin the semester with the book by Robert Birnbaum, How Colleges Work. Mm -hmm. And the key to that book is process. The takeaway from the book is process. And the success of any change initiative on a campus is a function of process. We work in institutions where shared governance is central, there's governance that's shared with the board, governance that's shared with faculty, governance that's shared with staff and students. 
So you have a desired outcome. You've got to back map the process to ensure that each of those constituency groups has an opportunity to be part of not only the ideation, but the solution and the implementation. And where change sometimes falls apart is you get ahead of the process. Birnbaum talks about the greatest idea in the world will still fail if the process is flawed. And processes can move quickly. We've heard two examples here today of how Pellissippi moved quickly, both with a ransomware attack as well as with the pandemic. But it's getting people to see the reason for the change and then sometimes to use a crisis as a great opportunity to drive change. We are right now, it's not a crisis, but it could be if it doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. We are moving from Banner to Oracle. We've been on Banner since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. um, it's clunky, it's obscure, it has all these bolt-ons and add-ons. If you want to hire a volunteer faculty member in the College of Medicine, there are nine people who have to sign that piece of paper, including myself, a volunteer faculty member. International travel requires eight signatures, all on paper. So what we're saying is all of these processes will no longer exist. We're going to go to a best practice outcome. So we're using the disruptive aspect of a systems change to help move us towards a more efficient and effective outcome for the institution. So process, process, process. We change the way we do budgets at the university, moving from top down to bottom up, decentralized, to give deans and units more control over the distribution of funds and the generation of funds. Um, it used to drive me crazy every June when I'd see all this furniture coming into the building and perfectly good furniture going out of the building. And I'd ask unit directors, why are we buying new desks? Well, if I don't spend the money, it reverts. Like, this doesn't make sense. So we changed the process. Units that conserve now receive 50% of their fall out. It goes back to the unit. The other 50% goes to central admin. As a result, we've doubled our level of reserves in the past decade because people now own the outcome. So I just can't stress enough that we are flexible, we are nimble. The best investment anyone can make is an investment in their future. The best investment the state makes is the investment it makes in post-secondary education. Process is the key to getting a wise return on that investment from a, from a change perspective. Right, right. That's great. I mean, you know better than anybody, um, a lot of community college faculty and staff are really experiencing a lot of burnout right now. Uh, a lot of time and energy spent not only during the pandemic, but we've been in this kind of constant cycle of thinking about how we increase student success, right? Our numbers have not been good for a long time. So Dr. Wise, you know, when we think about the fatigue factor, right? We've got a lot in nationally, a lot of folks leaving higher education from that fatigue. I mean, what do you think the future thinking is that we should be doing as higher education professionals about how to take on this work when we know it's important, we know what we need to do, but people are just burned out. Yeah. And the burnout extends to the president. <laughs> <too. laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, I think part of, you know, I'm going to lean on some things that we talked about in the pandemic, right? We, we asked our faculty and staff to respond to our students with a sense of compassion and con care and concern. And the reality is that's how organizations have to respond to the folks who, who do the work on, uh, on campus, right? We have to have compassion and care and concern. And we've tried to do it within the sort of regulatory framework that's existed over the course of the last couple of years um, in particular, you know, one of the ways we managed ourselves through the, the pandemic was through a crisis response team, right? So late February, early March 2020, we're meeting three, four times a day trying to figure out what, you know, what our next steps are. And then, of course, eventually we have to go, hey, we can't be in the same room together. We're going to virtual meetings and we're still on campus. I can't be on campus. We're going we're gonna to operate this thing from, from home. But that, you know, that it was a group that was created in response to a crisis and tried to work our way through, through, through the pandemic. And we, we kind of drew that to a close um, as the ransomware attack faded into our rearview mirror mm -hmm. um, and began talking about, you know, how can we think of well, about well-being at, at, at Pellissippi State uh, in terms of the po folks who are part of this community? Um, I mean, I'll say as a leader, it, it is hard to lead if you don't take care of yourself first. Um, uh, that if, you know, that if, that if, if you're not doing the things to, to ground and center yourself, and the same thing's true for our employees. So how can we provide things to our employees that help them find uh, center and help them find the place to be grounded as they do this work, which is incredibly important and at times incredibly challenging um, and at times is an incredibly heavy burden to bear 
um, for many of our folks. Um, so one of the things we did during the pandemic was we used um, some of the federal relief dollars to hire a counselor for our employees, right? We'd always had that resource available for uh, our students, so we used those federal dollars as part of that process to say, hey, if you need somebody to talk to and, you know, EAP is not always the easiest uh, to get through and make that connection. There's, there's somebody in an office at Pellissippi State that you can make a virtual connection to or you can walk in and close the door and say, hey, this is, what, this is what's on my list. And we've actually continued that into this, this budget year because I think it's important that, that folks have an opportunity to say, this is what I'm dealing with. Um, and I think as institutions, we have to help folks deal with it. Now, all that being said, we've done some things that have increased the churn. You know, we did – you know, looking at our fiscal situation, we did a voluntary buyout. So we've lost a lot of legacy uh, employees at the institution and, and created some gaps. But um, we also have some great um, professional development through our human resources depart department where we talk about what the mission is of the institution, what the values are of the institution, what we believe excellence is in terms of delivery to our institution so that those new employees who are coming on board can understand who we are and what we hope to accomplish um, and how critical the role is. Um, but uh, it's certainly a challenging time period, but you know, as, as Dr. Nolan has said a couple times, and I, I certainly believe it, it in, in the end it comes down, can you create an environment where the folks that you've worked with, your colleagues, can execute on the mission? I want to follow up on the, the point of, of well-being and, and kind of the question you asked earlier, faith and trust in post-secondary education. I, I think as leaders – at a campus level, at a community level, we've got to find opportunities to bring people together and purposefully celebrate our accomplishments. You know, coming out of COVID, we've been very thoughtful on how we can bring the campus together, giving folks half a day off for campus volunteer work, close the campus so you can get out and serve. We've put celebratory activities together. We had 900 people come to a common place to sing Christmas carols and turn on lights at the holidays last year. I think we need to step back and realize, are people tired? Yes. But do we have a mission to serve? Yes. And there are few other entities in the country that people still care so deeply about. I've had weddings occur on our campus. There have been six funeral services that occurred on our campus. Do you know anyone who works in private business who someone loved the institution so much they wanted to have their funeral services at the local Ford dealership? No. The other day, I saw a student on campus that was playing basketball, and he had a big E on his shoulder. And I said, what caused you to get the university logo tattooed on your shoulder? He said, Dr. Nolan, I love this place. And it doesn't matter if it's us or UT or, or, or any institution. There are few entities that are loved the way we are. That is a precious gift. So I know people are tired, but drink some more Diet Coke. Wake up. <laughs> Realize what's in front of you. The most beautiful thing in America is in your hands. If you're not excited about that, go find something else to do. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, and I mean, that's, oh, again, as we think about as a leader, sharing that optimism, right? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things we've included in our steps towards excellence here at Pellissip, you know, celebrate success. So tomorrow, Friday afternoon at 2.30 at in the cafeteria annex, we're going to have a celebration of the end of the enrollment cycle. Numbers weren't across the board as good as we wanted them to be, but we're up in dual enrollment. So we're going to celebrate that, that fact. Carol, plug yours. We're going to celebrate the fact that we've successfully <laughs> hosted the Board of Regents meeting, uh, right, uh, and given everybody a box lunch and <laughs> sent them on their way and wished them well. Um, and we're going to celebrate the fact that we've, you know, we've made it through the first month of the semester, right? We're full, first full month and fall is here, and it's just a time to get together. Um, and that's one of the things that we've lost over the course of the, the last couple of years, a chance to bump into people in the hallway and say, hey, how are your kids doing? Um, or, hey, thanks for helping out my student in, in engineering. You're, you know, your, the, your advisor, you know, the, the advice you gave him was really right on spot, and he's ready to, to, to make, to make the, the transfer. So I do think that notion of celebrating the work we do, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, you know, on commencement day, I would sign up to do this for free. Um, right, because it's, I mean, that's, that's where the return comes, at least from a psychological perspective. Um, now, there are other days where, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't say the same thing, but, um, you know, we get to do something where you change, you change somebody's life, um, and man, that is powerful. I agree. And it's all about community, yeah. right? Absolutely. I mean, both on campus as well as the greater community, so that's great. All right, final question, right, as we close out. One key takeaway, 
um, from folks that you, from your experience, you know, that would help give them maybe an edge in how they navigate disruptive transformation? What would your key takeaway be? This is your campus. You get to go first. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to say it's something that we've been thinking about. And uh, again, I'm, I'm glad that, that, that Brian's here, Dr. Nolan's here. You know, it's really how do you, how do you integrate the work? successfully, right? We can't, we can't do this work in, in a silo. We can't do it in silos on our campuses. We can't do it on silos in our community. We can't do it in silos on our state uh, and across the state. It's really too important. So how do we look at what's on the table, all the things that we have to deal with, you know, the sort of increased tension in the political environment, the fact that the college rate is, is, is going down, um, find that commitment to our mission, look at the people who can help us do that work, and then really commit to building the kind of relationships that say, you know, we're, we're willing to do, we're willing to change some things. We're willing to try some things differently because we know in the long term it's going to increase the, the, the success of the folks that live in Knox and Blount County or in East Tennessee or in Tennessee as a whole. I think as, as I look at what is maybe the, the next chapter of, of my career in the state of Tennessee, um, I think I've got... 20 more years left in me, and I hope to have the chance to continue to work and serve the people of the state. But it's the opportunity in the next chapter to learn from the mistakes that were made in the first chapter. I was with a group of individuals who I had the chance to work for in the late 90s, and we were talking about the college going rate challenge. And you know, I said, I feel as if everything I've done in my career to move the needle on college going rate, lottery scholarship, gear up grant, outreach program, one-stop shop websites, none of it worked. And you've got to be prepared to charge the hill again. And the gentleman turned to me and said, well, Brian, you had the opportunity to charge the hill again. Learn from the mistakes, look at what you would have done differently, and you have an opportunity to try to move the needle again. North of us, there are counties where less than 40% of the students move on to post-secondary education. That's not a university. That's TCAT. That's community college, anything. What happens to the other 60 students? What opportunities are they going to have if they don't realize the opportunities that are in front of them for advanced skills certification and training? So I'm excited about the opportunity to charge this hill again and to see what we can do as a state to drive home conversations about the importance of post-secondary education, training beyond high school, training for individuals who may have stopped out to come back and take advantage of all the things that are here. This is a state that is a wonderful place. We've got all the policy mechanisms in front of us, but it's the relationships I think we've got to come back to. And if there's anything that I miss from being in the board, it's the relationships with colleagues in the community college system, many of whom I've not seen since before COVID. So I thank you again for the opportunity to be a part of this uh, because it's renewing in many ways. Yeah, well, I really thank the two of you for this great conversation today and, and sharing some, some personal reflections on your leadership and experiences. Um, I, this is a topic that we're going to continue, uh, you know, in the podcast series. For, so for those of you in the audience or listening to this podcast, uh, next month we're going to focus on lessons from the field of student affairs specifically with panelists who represent a continuum of experience from a senior student affairs officer to someone who's new in the field, less than five years, uh, and really hear their personal experiences and being led through change by, you know, maybe their president or a senior leader, um, but also how they feel they contribute to that change process within their roles. So looking forward to that. Again, thank you, Dr. Wise and Dr. Nolan, for your time today. Uh, really appreciate you helping me kick off this podcast. Uh, and so with that, I, I look forward to future conversations. Great. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Fleming. Thank you for listening to this edition of From the VC's Bookshelf, brought to you by TBR, the College System of Tennessee, powering the state's economy and changing the lives of thousands of graduates starting successful careers each year. To learn more about upcoming book selections or to register to attend discussions live, visit tbr.edu slash bookshelf.